Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Much Love Podcast. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to bring a guest I've wanted to have on the show for a while. If you're not familiar with who he is, you're already familiar with his work because it's literally all around us in this studio. Everyone give a warm welcome to Mr. Robert Lewis Clark. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here with Nate and do this podcast. I'm thrilled to have you. Um, I always like to ask my guests if there's something timely going on, and there's something pretty timely going on for you. But before we get into that, just for a general intro for people unfamiliar, um, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about yourself and the the kind of work that you do. Well, I'm a, a multidisciplinary visual artist. I do abstract paintings. I do a few, what would you call it, um realism, abstract paintings. I do a lot of action paintings. I do pretty much the whole gamut when it comes to using the paintbrush and paint. That's a perfect description. And for a visual example, we've got this one right here. Then we've got a fan favorite right here. I definitely want to dive into talking a little bit about this project because when you explained it to me in your studio, it hit me right in the heart. But first, I want to talk about what's timely. Um, For people who are unaware, in Chicago, we're currently working on the Presidential Library. That is in honor of our president, the 44th president, Barack Obama. Um, And you contributed to it in a pretty interesting way. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit uh, about the painting that you made, and then I'll I'll show everybody a print. Okay. Well, uh, several years ago, um, after Barack Obama won the first election, there were a whole lot of artists doing paintings of Barack Obama. And uh, I guess I was inspired by that, um, you know, just to do a painting of Barack Obama, but I didn't know exactly how, you know, I would bring that to fruition. But what inspired me the most is after the first election, on the first election, the night of the elections, I actually was in the Congress Hotel, which is across the street from Grant Park, where half of Chicago gathered for the results of the election. And me, my wife, and our son, and a very good friend of mine, we had like a window view of the park. And there had to be close to two million people in the park. And just seeing that alone, that amount of people that I had never seen in one place before, I was I was inspired, like, wow, this news is some great news. I have to do something great. So, but like I said, um, the inspiration was there for me to do a painting. And when the time came, I was, you know, telling everybody I was going to do a painting. It was going to be a big painting. And, and so my mother and her husband had a collection of newspapers from the day after he won the election. And they, they gifted me the newspapers. So I was like, wow, I got to do something with these newspapers. What am I going to do? So like I said, some time passed, and when I was, you know, committed to doing the painting, I figured out a way that I could do a painting and still have the newsprint actually show up through the stripes that I was going to, you know, do in the flag, and you could actually see the original newspapers with all the clippings and pictures of Obama and the scenes in Grant Park of, you know, him winning the election, and, uh, Like I said, so that was several years ago, and now that original painting has garnered the attention of some, uh, the people in charge of the library. Um, Last week, they came to a location where the flag now resides, which is at the Parkway Ballroom in Bronzeville, and they saw the flag in person, and they they were impressed. So we're now in talks of having the flag reside at the Obama Library. Uh, The biggest hurdle is finding a wall big enough to house the painting, because like I said, it's a very big painting. I think you said it's eight by 10? It's eight feet by 10 feet. So, and one thing, they've already acquired all the art that's going in there, but they said they're going to make room for this one, and they even mentioned the presidential reading room which lets me know 
that's where it may wind up. So they may have to tear some walls down and make a bigger wall for that one. But like, like, we, like you said about, we have a print that uh, we're gonna show. So I have, I did a limited edition of 100 prints, which is, they're getting low now. They are, they asked me to send them one of the prints, which will reside, which is going, going to go into the presidential archives, which is great. So if you don't have one of these prints, you might want to get yourself one now. Because like I said, the, the limited edition of 100 is down to below 30 now. That's incredible. This is actually when I'm going to show the print. If you're just listening to this, I definitely recommend you go into the resources section and find one of the links that showcases the print. Uh, but if you're watching this on YouTube or Spotify, here we go. <laughs> wow. That, that, that's just amazing. Just the, the detail that shows up in the print. I'm still impressed. Every, every time I look at the print, I, I get impressed. I think a really well done print is impressive because sometimes it's hard to capture all the detail and all the emotion of a painting in its natural form. Yes. I know I'm not the most talented photographer and I'm usually very disappointed with how I photograph my own art. So for you to be not only satisfied, but impressed with the print is, is saying something. It, I've got to find a place of where it's going to go in here. We'll find a place for it, Nate. But um, I used a professional photographer to take this picture for me. Um, and he, he, he takes a, he shoots a, catalogs for stores, you name it, Macy's, J.C. Penney's, uh, he shoots catalogs. So I knew I could trust him with getting this image complete and doing, you know, Photoshopping however he needed to do it. And it actually took him almost two weeks to uh, finish this print. Wow. The visual imagery that I get from what I see, I see obviously the red, white, and blue. Um, but I see President Obama within that, that blue and, and looking down, but almost in like a, uh, a warm, um, like fatherly kind of way where like you could look up to him there. He's setting the right example. Um, loving eyes. Exactly. Very loving eyes. I like the multicolored stars. To me, I kind of get like some diversity and I get, um, I get a spectrum as opposed to just what I traditionally see in red, white, and blue. Yes. This is something that I think represents the version of America that I identify with. Talk to me a little bit about what, what this means to you and, and what was behind it for you as you created it. Well, I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to put 50 stars on there. Like I said, it's important. Uh, he's the 44th president, so I decided to use 44 stars. And each of those stars were, of course, they were hand-painted individually and I used 44 different colors. You know, I used, I think, two sets of uh, oil pastels just to, you know, make sure I had different colors because like, like you said, he represents every color in this country. You know what I'm saying? There's all the colors in this country, he's representing us all as one. And like, like we said, I said, you know, the loving eyes that he's showing, which I was just reading about, uh, people giving you fake smiles and just the mouth, mouth moves. But if you look at the image again, you'll see in his eyes just the, the lines near his eyes where he's giving you a whole smile because his eyes, you can see the, the lines near his eyes. And I, I read that when people smile at you like that, that's a genuine smile. And that image I got of him off the internet. I searched the internet to find the best image that I thought would work best within the flag and because the image projected him like looking downward, I knew that he would be at the top portion of the flag looking down at anyone looking at the flag. So that's how I decided that. I think that's great. I know I don't wanna to get too deep into the politics of his presidency, but what has always impressed me about the way he was president is I thought it was very aspirational for how somebody should lead this country. The uh, respect he gave the position, the coolness he exuded as he moved through a room. I feel like the, the president, like obviously it's a big deal that he was uh, America's first black president. Um, but more than that, 
who he is as a human being take away the labels. I just think he did a fabulous job of representing the office. So to have a piece of art that so fabulously represents him, I think is special. And I recently heard somebody talking about how they grew up and their parents had a poster of JFK on the wall. And I was watching a, a period piece movie that took place when the schools in Boston were integrating. And they kind of used that to show the politics of families. One family had JFK on the wall. Another family had Richard Nixon in like a, a picture frame. I feel like this is something that I've wanted to have on my wall that I didn't even know I was missing. So thank you for giving me this. Thank you, Nate. I really appreciate your support. Um, and like um, the support that you give me and other of my collectors give me, that that adds to the fire of me to continue doing what I'm doing, which is create, which I get a joy out of doing, always creating. Perfect. I think that's a good way to transition into this incredible piece that's behind me. I want to give a little backstory. Um, one of my best friends in this world, Inez, brought me to your studio. She said, this is a guy you need to meet. And as we're walking around, I'm asking you about all the paintings on the wall. This one caught my eye because I could tell the album art. But then when you showed me the, the book that was on the side, I said, okay, there's a whole story here. So let's break it down. First of all, what's the name of this piece? Read a fucking book is the title for this piece. What a great concept. Read a fucking book. If you take one thing away from this episode, it's that. Go read a fucking book. Um, but why'd you call it that? Um, I wanted to get straight to the point. Um, it's on the television because, in my opinion, we're watching too much television. And if you want to get more in-depth with something and not something that you're forced to watch, you can read a book and pick up more information. Yeah. And I think the book you chose was really great. Um, what does The Alchemist mean for you? The Alchemist uh, changed my whole outlook on a lot um, because it was about a journey that we all take just to, I won't say arrive at greatness, but just to achieve the things that we put in our mind that we want to achieve. Um, I, I was inspired or not even inspired, but um, I was introduced to the book by Pharrell, uh, the artist Pharrell from the nerd, from what nerd, uh, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey introduced him one time or rather interviewed him. I'm sorry. And he taught, he said, well, she asked him about books he read. And he said, the one book he read that changed his life was called the alchemist. So being a fan of Pharrell and a fan of nerd, I said, alchemist, and let me look into this. So I went and bought the book and I read the book and I was like, wow, it opened my eyes. Like wow, life, there's a bigger meaning to life. And so I can't say that that book changed my life, but it gave me a more positive outlook on things that I could accomplish and things that I can do. Just a month ago, I had a guest sitting in that same spot who brought a copy of The Alchemist to this show. So if you're at home and you've heard The Alchemist now twice and you still haven't taken action, Read a fucking book. Read a fucking book. <laughs> Why did you choose the Kanye album as the piece to be on the on the screen? Um, because it intrigued me. Um, like I said, I like things that intrigue me. Um, that make you look at it more and you know more closely and in depth. And because it's a pixelated image of Kanye and a woman and the guy is holding a beer bottle. Uh, being an artist, you know. I find beauty in a lot of things, you know, nails on the ground, crushed cans, and I'm always wanting to, you know, see that and do something with what I see in my mind. I want to bring it to fruition and have a visual of it. So upon seeing that album cover, I said, okay, you know what, this, people love Kanye, so this will make them pay attention to it because they like Kanye. And then, like I said, I put it on the TV because we're all watching a TV. And I said, this is very, you know, it's very, very befitting. And I, you know, like I said, the book was actually nearby. And so that was like, hey, tie this into this image, put it on a TV. And this is an old school TV that I, I think a friend of mine had in his basement. He had four of them and I cut the, I opened the TV up and I cut the picture tube in half so I could mount it on the wall. 
And I put that image on there, you know. It took a lot of time. I think this is one piece of work I did that took a lot of time <laughs> to do, actually, to pixelate those uh, those little blocks on there. But uh, it was fun doing it. But, uh, yeah, inspiration. I, there were a couple of things involved in this that inspired me to do it. There's a lot of beauty in that story. The first thing that jumps out to me, how hard you had to work to make that, a lot of people don't know what's going on behind the scenes and literally don't know what's behind the, the cutout of that TV. You saw that when you put it up, right? I saw <laughs> it. I felt it. I lifted it. I, I brought it back from the studio. Like there was, so there's some weight to it. Um, but also, a lot of times people get sucked into what's on the screen. What's the thing that they can get that gratification from right now? And just to the side of it is the book. The book takes a little longer to digest, but it might have a little bit more of a lasting impact. And so sometimes when we're at home consuming content, what we might gravitate towards might not actually be the thing that's going to drive us towards the bigger, more long lasting impact. Um, what I also found interesting about that book specifically is one of the artists Kanye signed, uh, Big Sean, that's one of his favorite books. Wow. And he's told a lot of artists like, hey, you need to read this book. And it, it changed his life. Um, I was recently listening to a podcast where the host interviewed Mike Posner, who was coming up at the same time as Big Sean. And he talked about the shift Big Sean had right when he read that book. So there's something magical about this book. And there's something magical about the energy of people who allow it to transform their lives. You haven't always been a visual artist as your sole means of existing in the world. I found out today you also had a career in breakdancing. Yes, I did. I, um, my teenage years, I was, uh, I was overwhelmed with breakdancing. Um, but I was always involved with drawing since the early age of five years old. So my teenage years, I was doing graffiti. And uh, I was one of, you know, not to pat myself on the back, because I was one of the top three break dancers in Chicago. Um, I, uh, I had a manager at the time, and my manager got us, uh, we did an audition. We got the part in a movie uh, that was filmed in Chicago called Running Scared. And I've told you, I've heard of that, didn't know what it was. Who was the, the lead of that movie? Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines were the lead actors. And there's another actor that was in there, and I think this was his first movie he was in, and he's, uh, can't think of his name, but he's in a lot of movies now. No, oh, wow. I'm going to actually have to go back and, and watch that. Um, I know we were telling everybody about books, but I actually do love movies. Like, I, I'm a movie junkie, and I recently found the streaming app Tubi. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I've heard of it. I used to write Tubi off. I thought it was a joke, and like, oh, they're going to make me watch ads so I could watch movies for free. But now everybody you're paying is still trying to make you watch ads. So Tubi has really great movies that go far back. So I was reading a book from Quentin Tarantino called A Cinema Speculation. And he's talking about some of his favorite films and, and getting into the nitty gritty of, of why he likes it and going over how the screenwriting was done versus how the movie turned out. And like half those movies are on Tubi for free. So I'm watching uh, Bullet starring Steve McQueen that was, you know, in the late 1960s. Wow. And Steve. I'm getting like this great film education on Tubi. So I, I think that, uh, that that's pretty fascinating. To bring it back to you, though, I love how your paintings have a, a immense range. Even the three paintings that are, are in this studio that the print people saw, this and this, they're drastically different. Um, what what is it that keeps you from getting confined in a box in terms of stylistically? Because some of the most famous, well-known painters, I haven't seen anything different in a decade. And I'm not trying to take shots. You know, people like right. what they like. But how have you kept kept it different? About famous painters back in the in decades ago, they did paint different things. It's just um, the things they painted a lot of got more attention, uh, even as far as I'll. Picasso's a great example. Before he started doing the cubism, he was doing other stuff. He even did stuff that was uh, semi-abstract. Um, myself, I don't like to limit myself as to uh, what it is I I can paint. If if I uh, I get an idea of something that uh, takes me uh, to a different style of what I'm currently doing, I I have to do it. 
Because if I don't, it stays in my mind. So I have to bring it to fruition so I'm not thinking about it anymore. Uh, there are probably three different styles where people, if they saw my work out and about, they would know it's my work just because it's a lot of it out there. But um, bottom line, I don't like to limit myself as to what it is I produce. So yeah, you'll, I mean, and right now I have three different styles that I do and people, they could see the work and not see the signature and be like, oh, that's Robert Lewis Clark. Cause I, I met a couple people that have told me, I've seen your work before. And I even had somebody tell me they saw my signature and was like, I saw your signature first before I saw the work. So I don't know what it is about the signature, but long story short, I don't like to limit myself when it comes to my creativity. That's a right mindset in my opinion. Uh, it's a lot easier said than done when people are backing up truckloads of money to somebody to keep doing the same thing on <laughs> yeah, repeat. It uh, is. It gets boring. I, yeah. You know, and from a creative aspect, it, it gets boring, you know, and I, I don't want to be an artist that's known for doing one particular style. Well, I haven't made any of my works commercially available yet, but I've been painting since I was a child. I've had people ask me for them, pay me for some. They're up in a lot of people's homes. And from when I really got interested in painting again 10 years ago to today, there's paintings I look at and I go, I don't think I could do that again. <laughs> like I'm not connected to what was making that, but what I am making now is like, holy cow, like I couldn't have done this 10 years ago either. You could do it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, I sometimes feel like that about paintings I've done in the past. And I, I wouldn't tell myself I couldn't do it, but it's just, I don't want to do it. Fair. I think there is something though that even as simple as the techniques I use to create my backgrounds. There was one technique I was doing religiously for almost two years. And now I'm just not, not connected to it at all. I have to start my paintings in a completely different way. And then when we, we had our artist's field trip about a month ago and found those canvases, those burlap sacks, yes. I said, I've never done this. I have to figure this out. And then when you showed me a picture of how you did it, you did it totally different. So I think it's cool that we could start with the same baseline material and whatever is just inside of us just expresses itself completely uniquely. Doing something new. As I spoke about, you were doing something new. It's a good feeling. It's a great feeling. Yes. When you're looking for what's next in terms of whether you're just doing what I would call like a rep piece, like, oh, I just got to get this thing out of me. because series. Yeah, versus, yeah, whether you're doing something that's like, all right, express the energy of today versus a series or a collection or something monumental. Is there a, a process you go through or is it just what comes to you? It's just what comes to me. Um, I could be working on a series or starting a new series and tell myself, oh, I'm going to do a, like the burlap bag. I said, I'm, I'm going to do two of these, you know, and keep it at that. But like I said, I did those and they sold and I was like, hey, I liked how they turned out. I said, you have to do some more of these. So I have another 12 supports of burlap waiting on me to paint on them. And I've already made up in my mind that after I do those 12, I don't know when I'm gonna do some more. I'll get to it, you know, when I feel the urge to get to it. You know, just because I know there's gonna be something else that comes along that I wanna do. Is there something that you've done before that is such a departure from what you normally do, whether it be sculpting or incorporating models or like, is there, is there something that was just out there for you? Yes, there's, there's the paintings I did a while back. I did four of them and they, and I sold them and I did four and I had never done no more. You know, like I said, it was an idea I had and I was actually de depicting a scene like a corner. You see, you know, a corner and a, a stop sign, a stoplight with the name of a street and I sold them. And I, I just never did any more, uh, but maybe because they were out of my view and out of my focus, that's one reason. But uh, the client that bought them had sent me a picture of them like, hey, remember these? And I was like, damn, those were so fucking sweet. Why didn't I do more? So you know what I did? I did two more because they were just so sweet. But like I said, um, and I don't know when I'm going to do any more of them because I know they are, like I said, I, right as currently as we're speaking, I have several more, I think maybe five to six different types, styles of paintings that I want to do. 
and it's all just kind of sitting there waiting, waiting to come out. Waiting to come out. And like Do you I said, think about them when you sleep at all? Like when you're right, trying to... What's th- crazy, I, I don't have a lot of dreams about painting. I've had dreams about fucking a painting up. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to actually like doing the painting, no, I don't have those dreams. And that's probably because I won't, I won't say it's not that I'm not excited about it, but I think like just the, uh, the fear of actually doing it is no longer there. For me, sometimes I go to lay down and go to sleep and I just I can't sleep yet. And I'll close my eyes and I'll see a bunch of colors or I'll see something happening. And I'm like, babe, I got to go paint. And she might be asleep already. She might be like, uh, like grabbing at me. I'm like, I got to go paint. And I go in the garage and I'll paint and it might be 15, 20 minutes. And then I sleep like a baby. Wow. I don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, my problem is when I wake up in the morning and take my son to school, I go to the studio and that's when I'm at my, my, my peace, my best, you know, I'm, I'm very relaxed, you know, cause I know I can get work done there. But, um, throughout the day though, if I'm out of the studio, I am thinking about working. And one thing that I've learned to not do is to force myself to work. I, I go do the work when I'm, I'm relaxed and I know I have all the time I had, I need, I'm not in a hurry to get finished doing what I'm doing because I have a timeline. I got to be somewhere at a certain time. And that's when I'm most productive, when I have my time to complete what it is I need to complete. Cause like you, I may, I might paint for, I've done paintings where I've worked 30 minutes on a painting and sold it for two, $3,000. There are times when I've worked for six or seven hours on one painting and sold that painting for less than that amount. But that's like my pleasure comes from just working, you know. And I was reading about an artist. I can't remember who it was, but they asked the artist, where do you find inspiration? And his answer was, when I'm working. And I'm like, damn, that, that's it. I get my inspiration from working. It's a great answer. It's a great answer. I'm a big believer that anybody who does any kind of creative work is working all the time. It's just different types of work. Because for a while, I was doing some executive consulting for this couple that was building a business. And I said, yeah, you're paying me for when we're sitting down and having a conversation. But you're also paying me for when I'm not working for when I'm at the gym, for when I'm going for a walk, for when my wife and I are at a movie, because you're paying me to take in other things and let that thing work in the background. So when I show up rested and excited for work, it's there. I'm not burnt out. And I think art is very similar. I know for me, I'm very influenced by the music that I listen to. Um, What types of music do you listen to and does it have an impact on what you create? Yeah, um, I listen to what's known as electro jazz. It's a lot of music. There aren't any lyrics to it. So I don't find myself singing along with songs that are playing. Of course, I like music with lyrics to it, but I like listening to the electro jazz. It's up-tempo beat, and it it elevates uh, not even my thinking, but just my mood. Because when I'm painting, I'm not thinking. I'm working. So I like to, you know... Feel, and I cannot work with no music. That's one thing. I cannot work with no music. I need something playing just to help me pass the time. I'm the exact same way. I walk in the garage and immediately I'm turning something on on my phone. I find that, A, I want to get your electro jazz playlist because that's right up my alley. I actually got my trumpet over there. I'm learning to play trumpet right now. Uh, I like electronic music. One of the paintings I just showed you is actually, uh, I called it uh, Murder on the Dance Floor because I had that song, Murder on the Dance Floor, stuck in my head. After I, wa- I watched that movie, uh, it was on Amazon, Saltburn. I don't know if you've seen it. What's it called? Saltburn. Saltburn. Yes. It's like, yeah, it's this creepy thing going on in uh, England, but uh, it was a damn interesting film. Like from an art perspective, like I had never seen that movie before. I, um, I, I did see that. And so when he's dancing at the end to that song, then my wife and I are out for sushi and like, oh, I know this song. What's it from? It's, oh, it's from that movie. I kid you not, that song has been just the background music in my head for the last three weeks. And it's up-tempo, it's exciting, it's bouncy. So like I I made something that's kind of up-tempo and exciting. Um, 
but I also crave music without words because I don't want somebody's words to influence my thought patterns. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's a funny thing because I do like music. Like I said, I like music with lyrics and I actually have some paintings that are titled a song and it's a song that have lyrics in it. I mean, I have multiple ones. I can't go right now off the top of my head, but I have multiple paintings that I have titled. Um, oh, I got another story to tell you too that I have titled, you know, of a song. But the story I want to tell you is about, so there's a series of paintings I do where there are random letters. Um, I call it, the series is called um, Cerebrum Capacity. Uh, when I was in college, I took a um, psychology course and I learned that our, our cerebrum controls our thoughts. So I called it Cerebrum Capacity because I wanted to see people's reaction when they saw just random letters and if they tried to make like a word out of it, a random letter, like a crossword puzzle. But anyway, when I'm doing those, I actually listen to the, now this work I listen when I'm doing, I listen to songs with lyrics. So what I do to stop the repetition of writing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which I found myself doing when I first started doing it, was I would take the first letter out of each word in lyrics and I would record it. So if the song said, I love you, baby, I would write I L Y B. And that helped me without doing repetition of the letters, which is interesting within itself. And when I tell, you know, my clients or my collectors, you know, that like those works and they buy it, they, they love it. It's cool on so many levels. I love when you said that I'm just going to put something random together and I'm going to see what meaning you try to ascribe to it. A lot of times I, I get these art stories on Instagram where I see somebody doing something that looks really random, but by the end of it, it's like, oh, you see the picture they were creating and it's beautiful. Um, but a lot of times I'm just making something random. And at the end, there may or may not be something that you get, but that's not the point to me. The point is the expression and it's the doing it, not necessarily can you put it all together. Yes. So letting the viewer ascribe their own meaning, I think is incredible. I will find myself doing with music. I have uh, Whole Foods bags that I tape together to put on top of my uh, table and I will like brush off my paintbrush on it. And it just creates these random paintings. Yes. And I have one that I'm finally ready to frame and I'm gonna bring it to market. But sometimes you, I had- You're talking about your, your uh, protective yes. bags. They're protecting your table. You're gonna bring it to market, meaning you're gonna sell it? Yeah, I'm gonna sell it. I got a story for you about that too. I can't <laughs> wait to hear it. Um, <laughs> if you look at it, you'll see words. And sometimes it's because I'll listen to something like, uh, I love Jackson Brown. I think he's one of the best American songwriters of all time. And he's got that, the song where he's talking about, uh, in 69, I was 21. And I, so you just see 69, 21. And then you might see like a, a phrase or a snippet of something from another song and another song, and then I'll paint over it. But what's left is like the whole process of what was going through me yeah. as I created 200 paintings using this protective canvas, but this protective canvas is one of the things I think looks the coolest. It's worth a lot of money. You tell me about your story. So um, I used to paint on uh, drop cloths. I would put my work on the floor in my studio and I would paint on, I had a drop cloth protecting the floor. So I guess I did maybe, I don't say, some anywhere between 50 to 100 paintings, I don't remember. But one time I was in my studio and I had just pulled something off a drop cloth and someone that was a, going on a tour in the building, they came in my studio as I was taking it off. And she liked the work on the walls and stuff. And I was, you know, telling her how much that stuff costs. And she's like, I can't afford that. So she looked at the drop cloth on the floor, which had all the remnants of like, like what you said, if I'm wiping my brush off of it or if I'm painting something, there's some overlap from my support I'm painting on onto the drop cloth. And she said, well, what's that? I said, I paint on top of that. She said, well, how much you want for that? I said, you want to buy that? So I said, how much did I pay for this drop cloth? So I doubled the price that I paid for the drop cloth and I told her, she said, I'll take it. So I know a few weeks go by and then she sends me a picture. She had it framed. And I was like, wow. I said, that is so cool. So she had my drop cloth, my spill drop cloth, my whatever you want to call it. She went and framed it. And it's, I got a picture of it in my phone. Like, that shit is cool as hell. So, yeah, dude, it's, 
and like you said, it's just random stuff. And like so much of it will create something, you know what I'm saying? It'll create something. Well, and when I was in school, in high school, I took this class that was basically like a pop culture study. It was an AP class to get like their AP language stuff done, but the teacher also made it super relevant. So we watched like Do the Right Thing and we analyzed a lot of the art that went into producing it and broke down stuff. And I loved that class because it helped me realize that yes, art is what our process is going through, but it's also on the audience. And once we put it out into the world, our opinion doesn't really matter anymore. It's what does the audience think? So you had all these great paintings all over the walls. And she goes, I like that thing right there. Sometimes we got to let people tell us, like, what is it that they connect to? And, and what do they resonate with and why? Yeah. I think she saw something in it that I didn't see. You know, she knew it was a part of me, uh, something that I worked on. And she, like I said, she saw something that I didn't see. And until she framed it, I saw it in a different way when it was all framed. Cause when I saw it there on the floor, it was like, you know, nothing to me. I mean, I guess maybe I'm around paint all the time and paint messes. And like, surprisingly today, I don't have on my work clothes, which I'm always in, you know, I wear pants and people are like, where you buy those pants at? I said, these are my work pants. <laughs> I work in these pants. That's funny. I, I used to have clothes I painted in and now because so much of my style is like go spend 10, 15 minutes with it and let it rest and then add a layer. A lot of times I'll just wear whatever I'm wearing. Um, or because half the time I'm painting it's at night when I try to sleep and couldn't, I'll just go naked and paint. So, <laughs> so I can't walk around in my paint clothes, <laughs> but there, there's something. Never done that. You know, there's something uh, freeing about that in my opinion. Um, but anyways, to get back to, one of the things you said is she saw something in me I didn't see inside myself. How often is that the case that it takes getting somebody else to tell you, no, I believe in you. I, I think that there's something there. Like, I know that's a thing that I've been looking for. And, and I've had so many people tell me like, no, just go, go do it. I believe in you. And even to have you here in my basement right now saying like, you could do it. I know that there's something there. Why do you think that sometimes when we, we create and we feel so strongly enough to do it, there's that thing that we, we doubt ourselves on, on that back end of it? Because we don't want to fuck it up. With me, that's how I am. You know, I get so uh, hesitant about doing something because I visualize it one way and nine times out of 10, when I produce it, it doesn't come out how I saw it in my head. So I'm constantly work on it until I'm satisfied with it. So, I mean, that's just me. That's how I am. And it was something else you said to me. I think you're talking about people telling you just do it. It was like that when I did this Obama flag. Uh, my One of my friends, good artist friend of mine, you know, we shared a, a space where our studios were in the same building. And so I was talking to him. Like I said, it took me a long time to do the flag. I was always telling him about the flag, what I was going to do, what I was going to do. He said one day, he told me, man, I'm tired of hearing you, you talk about this damn flag. Just do it. But like I said, it took me so long because I didn't want to mess the flag up. You know, I knew I had these newspapers and I, they had to be visible to read. So I was like, how am I going to do that? Ooh. So I, that was an instance where someone told me just do it. And he had faith in me. You know, he'd seen my other work, so he knew I could do it. How did you get started in art as a career? In what I mean by that is going out into the world and saying, all right, I'm going to sell my paintings, and this is how I'm going to earn a living. I mean, it's, there's, no, there's no definite way to do that. Um, some artists get lucky. I got lucky. Um, some artists that are very talented, they get discovered by the right people that can put you in the place to sell your work and be very successful. But I mean, like they're, they're different ways. Uh, I got lucky, I had a studio when I, I quit my job uh, because I had a surgery. My doctor told me I didn't want to be on my feet hour, eight hours a day. I quit my job, I had some money saved up, I went and got me a studio. Uh, when I did a show in my studio, uh, a friend came by and he was, so he loved my work. He said, man, I'm thinking of opening a gallery. When I open this gallery, I want to represent you. And he opened the gallery and I was his first artist. It was he and I that did the first couple shows in his gallery. And I haven't looked back since. And that's been 18 years ago. But like I said, there are a lot of talented artists out here. Um, 
And but no, let me, let me go. Let me uh, backpedal. I quit my job because I used to paint for myself. I couldn't afford art. So I would paint and hang it in my house. And my friends was always buying my art. That's what told me, get a studio and paint full time. But uh, no, there are a lot of talented artists out here. And, uh, you know, they meet the right people that put them in the right places to sell their art. Uh, it's hard to get into a gallery unless you, it could be hard to get into a gallery unless you know the, the gallerists, they know about you and they know you have a good record of sales and stuff and they'll, they'll, They'll want to sell your work. That's helpful. I know I tend to overthink it, probably because I've done so much in other businesses that I understand how those models work. Art has always felt like something totally different to me because I see the people on Instagram who are like, yeah, I just started listing stuff online and people start buying it. And I go, that's great. But I'm concerned with the reputation of Maybe I, I care too much, but like, does it look bad if I just go directly to people and just start selling stuff and then I'm not doing it right? Like I almost, I have this fear of like, because I don't know the marketplace, I don't want to look bad. And I, that even just saying that out loud, I feel like an idiot now just saying that because how many things have I done without worrying about how it looks? Well, you're not going to look bad, but when you say go to people trying to sell stuff, I mean, I'm not following you on that aspect uh, because if you're not going to someone if someone approaches you about buying your work. Um, but there's also nothing wrong with telling somebody, hey, do you want to see my artwork? You know, yeah. you, you, you got to put yourself out there. You got to let people know what you do. You know, it's not like we on TV with advertisements and shit, you know. There's nothing wrong with letting people know what you do. Thank you. You got to introduce them to, to yourself. Thank you. Yeah. See, a lot of times I'm having guests on that I think are super fascinating and I want to learn from, but also I have people on who I admire. There's something, some place you're at, there's something you're doing that I find interesting. So I want to celebrate it, um, but I also want to study it and learn from it. So even in our, our time here this morning, you've helped me unlock that next thing that I needed to hear. So thank you for that. You're welcome. My pleasure. I, I love talking about art. I can talk to someone about art for hours. Who are some of the artists that influenced you before you started creating at the level that you create now? Um, talking about the, the artists from the past? Yeah, I mean, anything that you saw that inspired whether you as a kid or a young well, adult? Well, the first one oh, as a kid, oh, there's some New York graffiti artists before I started doing art. Shit is... There's one now, his name is Futura. He's a great artist now. He does paintings. But he's from New York. His name is Futura. And then it was a lot of artists. You know, I just like their tags. And I mean, their names are, are escaping me now. But artists that I liked that inspired me to do the paintings, I started doing abstract paintings. Mark Rothko, Jack Jackson Pollock, Hans Hoffman, are... Uh, I liked Warhol, Warhol's work. I liked Basquiat work, but, it, you know, they painted people for the most part, and I didn't want to paint people. Like I said, I liked the abstract stuff that uh, Mark Rothko did and uh, Jackson Pollock because I could just see the, the freeness in their work. They weren't restricted as to painting how they felt, so which people call action paintings, you know, expressionistic paintings. You know, you got a lot, you got a lot of freedom with that, which... Is pretty much, if you're an artist, you want freedom. You want freedom to paint what you want to paint, because that's when you're going to do your best work, painting what you want to paint. I'm thinking back to, you said, one of the names I heard was uh, Basquiat. I was watching his, like, the Miramax movie about him from the 90s, probably when I was three, four months sober, and that was the first time I went back to painting as an adult. I painted all my childhood and then I got to middle school and high school and was too cool for that. And then I started painting again, I just picked up some uh, paper and some watercolors and something woke back up in me that was like, oh yeah, we could do this. This is fun. So I think that in summarizing a lot of the things you've told me that have been helpful, I got to put myself out there. I have to let people see me. I have to let people know what's available. There's a lot of people who don't know. I've got almost 200 paintings in yeah, this house. Yeah, I remember house. you told me that. <laughs> I got to start taking pictures of them, putting them back out in the world so people just know. That's right. 
And I think that that really goes back to a lot of this journey of self-discovery I'm on. I lost a lot of my identity in my drug addiction and my alcoholism. I lost a lot of that freeness that I had as a child. And this show has been a way of helping me re-engage and explore that. And the transition I'm having in my career is helping with that. What, if there is anything, gave you that permission to just be that free with yourself? Or has it just been this logical extension of how you were always moving in life? Um... I think my very beginning is in painting. I painted the things that I wanted to paint, and I didn't paint for acceptance, which I kind of I'm witnessing that witnessing that now with some artists I know. They paint for acceptance. They paint what people are familiar with. They're comfortable with it. And they're making money, so I'm not knocking them. But you know, that's what you do. Uh, but like I said, I I never started painting for acceptance. I started, and we spoke about this earlier, I was painting for myself to decorate my walls in my house because I couldn't afford art. And my friends bought everything I did. I painted, you know, that they were buying the shit for a little, what I spent on supplies. So no. Outside of art, what is it that you're most passionate about as a way to recharge? Or what, what are things you're just into in life that you're thinking about? To recharge. I like my me time. It's how I recharge. You know, I wake up in the morning, I'll go on my back porch, I'll have some coffee and a cigarette, shame on me, or I'll have my energy drink. But my me time is how I recharge. And that's, like I said, that's pretty much like 20, 30 minutes a day to where I'm not don't have to be somewhere. I don't have to do something. And that includes painting. But my me time that I'd sit and it's me and my thoughts, that's how I recharge. I like that. So it's no mess, it's not meditating, it's just me time. Yeah, uh, as I'm thinking about that, I know a lot of people, myself included, have a morning meditation routine or some sort of ritual. There's something very romantic about the coffee and cigarette ritual. I know a lot of people, that's their morning routine and they tend to be very happy and very free. So I'm not, you know, I'm not judging the cigarette. Um, I just think that it's there's something special to that just being the vehicle that allows you to just be. Yeah, I mean, because like it, it's it's not quiet time, but it's because it's a lot going on up in here, and I can pretty much focus on what's going on in my head as opposed to being around other people and hearing conversation or looking at something on TV or hearing some music. But that's how I recharge, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm not, I don't have to think about anything, you know what I'm saying? It's just stuff that the things I am, I'm an artist, I'm a creative artist, so I visualize the things that are going on in my head. A question that I ask all my guests, if you could meet anybody, who would it be and why? That's a good question. Thank you. Gandhi. What about Gandhi makes you want to meet Gandhi? I want to know what it takes to be at peace. Great that, answer. That would be my only question. What do I have to do to be at peace? That is a fabulous answer. <laughs> I firmly believe that whether it's in this life through meditation or it's in some future life, you will get a chance to ask that question. Wow. All right. Anything that you want our guests to leave with today, whether it's where they could find your works or whether it's something you want them to consider or take into their, their lives? Um, outside of my social media, which is where 95% of my sales come in because my website is still under construction after what, two years maybe? Robert Lewis Clark on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, the majority of, of the work that I post is for sale. Some of it sells rather quickly. So if you see something you like, send me a DM and we'll discuss it. And I think the other question you had was, I, everyone be confident in what it is you want to do, not what you have to do, but just, just be confident in yourself. You know, if you can put your mind to it, you can do it. I'm a, I'm a prime example of that, you know, and 
and prayer works. You heard it here. Be confident and prayer works. Thank you for being here, Robert. It was a real treat. Much love, everybody. Until next time.